So like Harry said, hi, my name is Joel. It's lovely to be with you this morning. We are starting our series in, in, in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Christmas in Narnia. Like Harry said, if you haven't started it yet, young or old, it's not too late. We are really enjoying it. We've got half a chapter as a family. We've been reading it uh, at dinner times because the kids eat slowly and I, and I eat fast. So we've got loads of time at the end of dinner to, to read together. And as Rachel like, encourages them to eat wherever they don't want to eat. Um, and it's been really great. And so I just encourage you. We've given a few more out this morning, but there's still some left, like Carrie said. And so we've got this weird thing where we're, we're reading from this and we're reading from this. And we don't want to get the two confused. So do understand, if you're new here, that we, we definitely put the Word of God above Narnia. But we're using it because, we like with the, the series we've just done, the Jesus series, we want a vision of Jesus. We, as we've read through uh, different parts of Jesus' life together, we want a, a vision of him. So that we, we do think, as we read this, it kind of, there's some biblical, there's some narratives in there that we can draw out that help us in this, in this Christmas season <laughs> that, that point us toward Jesus. Okay, they point us towards this, this book. So C.S. Lewis, he is a fantastic writer. And I, I'm looking forward now, genuinely, to reading the rest of it. Because it's been so many years since I read this series. or had this, I think I'd never read it myself, actually. I think it was my dad who read it to us as children. I'm looking forward now to reading it for myself again and to our kids as we get on to the, I don't actually know the next, what is the next one? Okay, there you go. The boy and his horse. That's what, the horse and his boy. I'm looking forward, we've got, we have got the series, I'm looking forward to reading them anyway. So I'd encourage you to get involved. Now some of you, you may not have ever read these or had them read to you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a blurb and then we're all caught up. Okay, there's just this two paragraphs I'm going to read to you. That I have the best blurb I could find online. And then we all, we're all, we all know where we're at. Okay, so the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, this book, not a blurb of the Bible. It says, when the Pevensey children, so these four characters we come across, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, step through a wardrobe in the strange country house where they are staying, they find themselves in the land of Narnia. Frozen in eternal winter, Narnia is a land of snow and pine forests, and its creatures are enslaved by the terrible white witch. Tempted by the promise of endless Turkish delight, Edmund becomes a white witch's servant, and it's up to his brother and sisters to release him from his enchantment and to rid Narnia of the witch. But just when it seems that all hope is lost, the great lion Aslan returns to help the children save Narnia. Okay, so over these few weeks, uh, can we, actually, can I just, let's just pray, if that's all right. Thank you, God, for just as we've been singing about the hope that you bring. The, the, the light that you bring into the darkness. I pray that as we, as we go, through, as we do the, go through the reading plan, but as we look on Sundays at this story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that we'd be drawn into your story, God. That this story would point us towards the greater story where we find true hope and joy and peace. And so, God, I pray, help us this morning to know, just know that, just a, just a glimpse of that, just a piece of that hope and joy and love and peace that you bring. Holy Spirit, do it by your, your power this morning. Amen. Amen. So, we are invited into this, this world with these uh, with characters, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And if, you've, if you know anything about the story, even if, if you've just started reading it this week in the reading plan, uh, like we have at our, our dinner times, you'll kind of pick up, even in those first four chapters, who the people you're really rooting for are and who the people you're really not rooting for are. Okay, unless you're, unless you're like a bit twisted or something and you love the really horrible, annoying, like spiteful people. Like even Edmund is already coming across as just a spoiler. If you're catching up this week, this number is not spoiling it too much. Edmund's not that great a guy. Okay, so he's one of the brothers. He's one of the brothers and he does not come across well in his first few chapters. And our kids have started doing it, especially our two boys. When they watch something, They'll, kind of, they'll say, oh, I want to be that person, or I want to be that person. There's just been a recent, I don't know why it started, but we're watching Power Rangers, and they say, I want to be the gold one, I want to be the red one. And then we were even watching something yesterday, watching uh, Santa Claus the movie. I want to be that elf, I want to be that elf. No, we can't be the same elf, you have to be... And they're picking up who they want to be in stories, and in this one, no one is picking Edmund. Okay, no one's saying, I want to be Edmund! 
I want to be that really obviously bad guy who's really selfish and not kind to anyone and horrible to his sisters. Right, no one's saying that. People, they, want to be, they want to be Peter or they want to be lovely, sweet Lucy. But they don't want to be, they don't want to be Edmund. And we're invited into this story where, like I said, we see these biblical narratives. We see kind of these Adam and Eve type figures and, and Jesus type figures. Um, and we see we're invited into this story. I read this, this quote earlier um, just this week that is helpful, or helped me anyway. This story has got everything. Right? We see honesty and truth-telling in all its simplicity. We see courage and bravery in all its shining glory. We see treachery in its ugliness. We see the face of evil. We see the face of good. And if you live in these stories and you soak in these stories and you breathe in the air of these stories, you'll find that your heart and your mind, your thoughts, your affections will be shaped and transformed so that you will come fully to reflect all that is true and good and beautiful in this story. And there's this, there's this quote that Aslan says, to, um, Aslan says to Lucy in one of the later books, The Voyage of the Dawn, Dawn Treader, and he says, this is the very reason you were brought into Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. Right? So knowing Aslan, knowing the story of Narnia, helps Lucy live in her world out, outside the wardrobe when she comes back through the wardrobe there. And it's the same for us, the same as we, as we read scripture, as we understand the God of this, of this book, as we understand his his love as we see him and know more of him and meet with him, right, it helps us to live here and now, to, to bring life, to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the glory of God. Like as we read this, we're invited into this story to play our part in the story that God is, has written here, but is still writing in Worthing and in the nations to see his glory made known. And so where we are in, in Narnia is it's always winter and it's never Christmas, right? It's dark in the world of Narnia. It's under the witch's spell. And we're going to hear more about, we're going to hear more about that next week with our family Sunday. Maddie's going to be speaking. Um, and we're going to have a great time as uh, young and old together looking at the next part of this story. But we're going to, we are going to skip forward a bit. So sorry if you, if you are, like I said, if you're only up to chapter 4, we're going to skip forward to chapter 7 and 8 this week. Okay? So on, and so you've got this to look forward to as you're reading through. Don't worry, I won't, I won't spoil it for you. But the world is in darkness. It is in need of light. It's in need of hope. Just like our world now is in need of, is in need of light in the darkness. It's in need of hope. And the children are having a dinner uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. Okay? So just to clarify, we're in this book right now. We're not, we're not in this book, okay? We're in this book. They're having dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and they hear that Aslan is on the move. Right? This whisper, Aslan is on the move. Aslan is coming. And when, when they hear his name, when they hear his name, the children, their response is different. It's like there's this mysterious power at Aslan's name. And in the next chapter, Mr. Beaver, he tells them that Aslan is the king of Narnia. He is the rightful king. He's not, not this uh, white witch masquerading as a queen, but Aslan is the rightful king. And he's not often in Narnia, the Beaver, Mr. Beaver says, but when he is, he makes everything right. And this is from chapter 8. And I'm going to do this in my best, like, reading a story at dinner time voice, okay? <laughs> Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Lucy. Susan, sorry. I'm reading ahead. Oh, said Susan. You're just like the kids. Pick up immediately. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then isn't he safe, said Lucy. <coughs> safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear the word, what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He is the king, I tell you. Right, so there have been, been these whispers of Aslan on the move. The lion is coming, Aslan is coming, the one who is going to bring hope. 
And just like we, we read about these whispers of Aslan, we read, as you read the Old Testament, right from, from Genesis 3, there have been these, these whispers of one who is coming, the Redeemer, the one who brings light to the darkness, who brings hope to the hopeless, this saviour. And as you, read, as you read the Old Testament, time and again, you think, oh, is this the, is this the person? Is it this guy? Or, and, then you, and you realize, no, that's, it's not them. And then you, you read a few more books later, and is it, is it this person? Is it this person? And again and again you read and you think, is it this one? Is it this one? There's whispers of this this saviour who's coming. It's been winter for a long time, but Christmas is coming at last. And Susan, she's surprised to find out that Aslan is a lion. She assumed Aslan was a man. She says, I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And she asks Mr. Beaver, is he safe? To which he replies, safe. No, but he is good. Right, and that's what I want us to see this morning. Because when, when you read the Old Testament and you read through and you, and you see the God's people, the Israelites, they, they understood that God wasn't a safe God. Right, their, their problems might come, there might be pain and there might be suffering and there might be difficulties. But the issue they, they had time and again was they also didn't believe that he was good. Right, Mrs. Beaver, she understood something the, the Israelites didn't. Right, Mrs. Beaver, she understands something about Aslan, that he isn't safe, but he is good. Whereas right f- through the Old Testament, we see that the God's people, they understand that God isn't safe, but they also don't trust that he is good. They, they think that their way is better than God's way. They think their own sense of goodness is better than God's goodness. And so they, go, they, look to the, they look to other people. They look to the nations around them. They look to the surrounding nations and all the gods that they worship. And they see these other gods that also aren't safe and also aren't good. And they feared punishment from these gods. And so they make sacrifices and follow these strict rules and traditions. But the God of Israel, what he was looking for, he wasn't, wasn't looking for that type of fear. But a fear birthed out of a knowledge of who he is, who Jesus, who God is. And God is, he is this big, awesome, majestic, all-powerful being. But unlike other gods, he is also lowly and humble and compassionate, forbearing and personal. Right? The Israelites were meant to fear their God differently to how the other nations feared their gods. They were to know that he isn't safe, but he is good. And it's the same, same for us. Just like Kelly um, shared as we were singing this morning, it's knowing that, that God is in control and we can, we can allow him to have control of our lives. Knowing that n- things may not always be easy, but God is good, he is for us, he loves us. Hebrews 4 says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you hear that last verse? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Right, so just as Mrs. Beaver, she understands that Aslan isn't safe, but he is good. So we know, we know, we serve the God of the universe, the one when we looked at the last week in Revelation 4 and 5, the the God who is seated on the throne at the center of the universe, yet we can draw near to him with confidence knowing that we can find mercy and grace. So how do we respond when we hear Aslan's name? Or how do we respond when we hear God's name? Right? Is it like Edmund, where we recoil from him in utter horror, thinking, he can't be good, he can't be for me? Or do we respond like Mrs. Beaver, who knows he isn't safe and knows that it's not maybe an easy trajectory Right? Life isn't always straightforward. There may be pain and suffering and difficulty, but through that comes joy and satisfaction and life, knowing that he is good, knowing that we can approach the throne of grace that we just read in Hebrews 4. 
coming with confidence to the one who is seated on the throne at the center of the universe. And we'll discover, we'll look more at that in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So maybe you're an Edmund. Maybe you want to be a Peter. Maybe you'd love to be all sweet Lucy or brave, strong Susan. But I'd suggest that all of us are more like Edmund than we would care to admit. Right? And maybe, some, maybe you're here and you're thinking you're more like Aslan, but I think we're more like Edmund. Right? More often than not, we are Edmund. From the beginning, he is a spiteful, nasty little boy. Right? He is disrespectful, he complains, he, he tries to get other people in trouble, he jeers and sneers, and he makes fun of his little sister Lucy when she goes through the wardrobe and then she comes back and says, I've seen this wonderful place, Narnia. And he, eventually, he finds out that Narnia is this place through the wardrobe, and he, says to, and he says when, I'll say sorry if you like, what a guy, and then he says, when she doesn't respond when he's calling her name, he says, oh, we had a fun conversation about this when we're reading it at home, oh, just like a girl, she's probably sulking somewhere and won't accept an apology, right? We're probably more like Edmund than we care to admit, because our lives will tell a story, right? We live in a, in a narrative, and it's just, we've got to decide, who are we centering our life around? What story are we living in? And so I wonder, if you, what story is your life telling? What is the trajectory of your life? Right, if, you went into, if you went through the wardrobe and into Narnia and you're, uh, with all your flaws, with your hidden sins or not-so-hidden sins, where would, you, where would you end up? Would it be around Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's table? Would it be in the White Witch's palace? Right, the good news is that Edmund's story, without giving too many spoilers away for those of you who haven't got there, the good news is that Edmund's story is not doesn't need to be our story, right? And it doesn't end in tragedy. It doesn't have to, or it doesn't have to end in tragedy anyway, right? As it's Aslan, it's the whispers of this one who is coming, right? The one who isn't safe but is good is Aslan who reaps what Edmund has sown, right? It's Aslan who takes Edmund's treachery and spite and beastliness and it's all thrown onto Aslan. The lion bears all of Edmund's sin, all of, his, all, of his, all of his rubbish, all of the stuff that he has done, and he bears it at a stone table that Pete's going to look at in a couple of weeks' time. Right, and that is the, the, you see this power in substitution. We see the, this deep power that will turn this, this beastly little boy into a wise and just prince. This deep power that changes lives. And so what we, who, who they believe Aslan is will help will, uh, def- shape how they live outside of Narnia. How we believe, what we believe about the God of this book, what you believe about the God of this book will shape how you live your life this Christmas, how you will live your life in 2024. Because if you believe, as we see in this book, then we, and we hold tight to God's word, and not, not just as a as some clever imaginings written up however many thousands of years ago, where if we take it as the, this is, this is the word of God, I, I, can, I believe in this Jesus, the one who I can draw near with confidence, then things don't look so hopeless. Things look, don't look so dark. Even when things are, even when night is at its darkest, winter is drawing in, we have a hope. Because we serve a God who loves us, a God who is seated on the throne. A God who is good. And so in this season, we get to look at this one who is coming, or we read about is coming, the one who came 2,000 years ago as a baby born in this humble, uh, lowly town of Bethlehem, who brought light into the darkness. And so we hear that just as they hear in Narnia that Aslan is on the move, we read in the Christmas story all those years ago that God was on the move. God was coming into, coming into our mess, into our, into our situation as a lowly, humble baby, the king of the universe. Hope is coming. And so we're going we're gonna, to uh, read together. And I wonder if you could stand as we do it. We're going to read Isaiah 9, if you're happy to. If you can't, then you can stay seated. But we're going to read Isaiah 9, 
verse 2 and then verses 6 and 7 together. And I'm just going to have a very short thing and then we're going to pray. Right, this, we're, this kind of leads us in to next week as we're going to look at these passages again as a church family together. Okay, let's read. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You can stay standing just for a minute. Ben, if you want to come up. Right, if you're here this morning, right, just, we want to make sure we get, we get our books right. right this is the book that we, that we look, this is the book that brings real life and transformation, that brings joy and satisfaction. And if, if you're here and Jesus isn't Lord of your life, if you haven't said, I've, if you haven't seen this Jesus, then I just encourage you just to ask him, say, God, Jesus, I want to see you. God, if you're real, I want to know you this morning. I want to know you this Christmas time. I want to encounter you. Let me see you. And for the rest of us, we, over this Christmas, I just want us to pray that we would know the hope that, to which we have been called. Right? That we would bring hope wherever we go this month. That we would bring light into the darkness. That quote I read at the start. This was the very reason you were brought into Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you might know me better there. God, I pray that as we, as we know you, the God of this book, by the power of your Holy Spirit at work in us, God, it would enable us to live lives as we go from this place for your glory. That we would shine as lights in the darkness. That your kingdom would come this Christmas season. 